This video is going to talk about configurations out of section 14 of Hard Insurance textbook. So the first thing is we're going to look at what a configuration is. Don't overthink it. It is simply going to be a set of some of the points and lines in in our in a Cartesian plane over some field F. Okay. So in terms of dealing with configurations, there's a bunch of different types of questions that you could be asked about configurations and this is the same strategy that you would use on all of them. The first thing that you'd want to do for your configuration, your collection of points and lines out of your Cartesian plane, is you label all of the points that you're going to care about. Okay? By default, these are all of the points that are going to be useful to you. How do you tell if they're useful? For sure, any point that is also the end point of one of your lines or line segments um, is going to be a point you're going to care about. Okay. Now every so often you're going to care about some point that's in the middle of a line segment and this would occur anytime you have two lines intersecting at that point. But in general most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time you're only going to need the points that are really end points of some of the line segments in your configuration. You will need to identify which points you're going to choose to be the origin points and the unit points. You're also going to need to identify or choose which of your lines from your configuration are going to be your x and your y axis. Please note this step two in our strategy is 100% based on the theory in Proposition 14.2, which says you can always do a linear change of variables. If you don't remember what Proposition 14.2 is, now would be the time to pause this video and go look it up. Okay. The next thing that you would want to do is you want to find the equations of all of your lines and points in your configurations, um, equation of the lines, and then the coordinates of the points. Now, sometimes you'll be able to actually find the numerical values of all of your coordinates of all your points, the numerical values of all the slopes and the intercepts of all of your lines. However, typically what's going to happen, and we'll see this today, is that you're going to have your unit points and your origin point, which are known with coordinates of zeros and ones. And then you're going to have some points where you don't quite know what they are, so you'll put in some dummy variables. For us, we'll use A today because A is the first letter of the alphabet. Okay, And then we'll be able to write all of the other points, their coordinates of those other points, as well as the equations of all the lines in terms of that stand-in letter A. And then at the end, we'll actually be able to solve for letter a, so at the very end of the day, we actually will get the numerical values of all of these points and these lines. Okay? Now, once you have the equations of all of your lines and points, then you use this information to answer whatever question you have about the configuration. Now, we're going to go over two different examples today. The first one is going to talk about Pappas's theorem. And that one is where we're actually going to use this strategy of dealing with configurations to prove why Pappas' theorem actually works and is always true. The second example that we're going to have is going to be the question of does this configuration actually occur in the given Cartesian plane? Or really the question is not phrased that way. The question is which Cartesian plane does this configuration exist in? Okay, and that and these two examples are going to be asking us different questions. So we'll be using this information of the configurations in slightly different ways in the two different questions. Now, just to do a quick reminder, we are dealing with a Cartesian plane over in a field. This capital pi here indicates your Cartesian plane. The f indicates your field. And to remind ourselves what a field is, it is simply a set of numbers or objects that have two operations involved, a plus and a multiplication. And if you are uncomfortable with fields, this is the point where you should stop this video, go back and look up fields. Okay. The things that you want to get out of this is that addition and multiplication act just like you would expect them to act on real numbers. And in terms of the common examples of infinite fields that uh, we deal with, whoa, did not want to do that yet. Um, Real numbers here are a field, fractions are a field, and the last one that I do want to get to, and I can't get to it without going ahead and putting in all this middle stuff, is this guy right here, q adjoined square root 2, where we took all of our fractions and we threw in an extra square root 2, where square root 2 is not currently a fraction, so we made this field larger. Please note you just don't throw in the one extra 
uh, number, you have to then have that number, that square root 2 here, being multiplied in and added as many different ways as it possibly can, okay? Which is why our format actually looks like this. And you can always throw in extra numbers that weren't originally in your field and create a new larger field, okay? So that's the background that we need to get. Now, jumping into the configurations, configurations by definition is simply some set of points and lines that are inside of your Cartesian plane. So if you're going to be dealing with your configurations, we already gave a rough outline of what to do, but let me do a little bit more specifics here. So dealing with a configuration. First thing that you want to do, if it's not already done, make sure you label any of the points that you want to deal with. So label points. And just like normal, you want to label your points in the standard with capital letters. Okay. You also want to go ahead and then apply our proposition 14.2, so our linear change of variables. What does this mean? You're going to select your x and your y axes. And remember, these guys have to be lines that intersect. Once you have your x and your y axes, your origin point is going to be that intersection. You then have to choose your unit points. And these can be any points on your two lines that you've just chosen as your two axes. Just they can't be the origin. So somebody else on those two lines. Okay. Then typically you have one or two points. In our examples today we're just going to have one point. But typically one to two points where you don't know what the coordinate is. So maybe you have something like a point C here and you have some unknown first coordinate. Now that point A, so this would be an example, that point A would need to be inside of your field. Okay. So if you're trying to search for what the field is, this would be where you say, all right, well, let's assume that A my unknown entity right now is inside of my field. If you do know what your field is, say it's the real numbers, you could say, hey, let's, A has to be a real number. Okay. And here's the other key thing. This guy does have to be on either the X or the Y axis. Now that's just labeling your points. Okay. The next thing that you want to do is you want to find all of your points and the equation of all of your lines in terms of that unknown A. So find all points in the configuration in terms of the number 1 that I was trying to say that's inside rationals or it's part of your set of all your fractions or your variables. And when I say variables here, this would be whatever you've picked for this unknown guy, like this A from over in point C, our example point. Okay. For us, we're going to be dealing with fields between the set of rationals and the reals. So all of our fields are going to either look like Q or Q adjoin something all the way up to R. Okay. So somebody like that. We also want to go ahead, so this is all of your points. We also want to find the equations of all of the lines in the configuration. Okay. Again, this would be things like y equals mx plus b, or you can have your vertical and horizontal lines, maybe y equals c, x equals d, something like that. And here, your slopes of your lines, so the M and the B or the C and the D, all need to be inside of your field. Okay. Typically speaking, these guys are going to turn out to be either fractions, where you'll actually get something like a one-half, or they will be something in terms of A, so maybe they'd be like 1 plus A is your slope. Okay. Now, you still don't know what A is, but you'd be able to find that. Okay. Now, 
Once you've done all of that, then you can go ahead and answer whatever question is actually asked. Answer question ask and the problem you're given. Okay. Now, one of the things that we're going to be doing is verifying if a configuration actually exists in some Cartesian plane. So here's what you would do for that step four in that case. Okay. So first thing is here I went ahead and did, I typed up the same beginning parts that we did before. Label all of your points so they're intersections of some endpoint of a line and another line. Find the coordinates of each point and the equation of each line in as few unknowns as possible. These unknowns are those same A's that we've done in the past. Use some key item. This is typically the slope of a line or some point. What I have found is while I personally often will default to looking at a point, most people when they're first starting will look at the slope of a line and quite honestly it's easier. I don't know why my brain goes to a point. Okay. This is something that can then be calculated in two different ways, or you try to find something that can be calculated in two different ways. For example, if you're looking at the slope of a line, so here's a line, it has to have at least three points on the line in order to be calculated two different ways. So maybe this is, I'm going to be super lazy, points A, B, and C. Your slope could be calculated by way of point A and B. It could also be calculated by way of points A and C. Okay. Then what would you do? You'd set those two slopes equal to each other. At least one of them would need to be in terms of your unknown, like your A that we used before, and then you would be able to solve for A. And we're going to see that in a little bit. Okay. So you'd set whatever the two formulas are equal to each other because they were just found two different ways, but they're supposed to be the same thing. And this is where you solve for that unknown A. Then, after solving for that unknown A, you then look to see what value must be inside of your field if anything. So for example for us our smallest field that we're going to be looking at is going to be Q. So if you get something and your unknown up here is something like 1 plus that was so trying to be a 1 plus just a second we'll make it look less like an H. 1 plus the square root of 2 over 2 it's typical to get quadratic equations and so that's a standard form. So this means in terms of your field operations you have to have square root 2 inside of your field. Okay. Well notice our smallest field Q doesn't have this guy in there. It has the 1, it has the 2, that's fine, but the thing it's missing is the square root. So what would you do? You would throw that missing square root 2 into your field and then the new field would be Q would join the square root 2 and that guy would then be the smallest field that would work with your configuration. Okay, So that would be the idea of this what must be adjoined to, what must be in your field. Okay, So let's actually jump to an example. And the first example that I've got for us actually is not does the configuration exist in our Cartesian plane. Instead it's going to be a little bit easier than that, and then we'll jump to an example where we verify that the configuration is in the Cartesian plane. So that's our background. Let's actually do stuff now. So only two examples for today. The first one is Pappus' theorem. Pappus' theorem goes as follows. It says you've got some Cartesian plane over some field F, and suppose you know there are two lines for sure in this Cartesian plane. Okay? You know that the points A, B, and C are in or on your line L, and points A prime, B prime, and C prime are on the other guy. Not going to lie, I tried to make this guy a nice little scripty N, and, well, I can't get a scripty N to type up well here. I'm sure I could, I just didn't find out how before we need to record this. So, such that, and here's the thing that we have. If we look at the line segments A, C prime, and A prime, C, strategically chosen here, so you've got A, C on both of them, and the prime on the opposite letter, those guys need to be parallel, and BC prime, B prime C, again, BC with a prime on the opposite letter, are also supposed to be parallel. Then Pappus' theorem says, well, automatically, we're actually going to have the last pair of guys, AB, where the primes on the B or the A, must be parallel. So this right here is your conclusion. Okay. Now, for this proof, I'm going to outline it, but I'm also going to start off with the first part, case one. What happens if your two lines are parallel? 
Well, if your two lines are parallel, our L and our what was attempting to be a script N, what happens? Well, I'm going to force the first part. So I've got here AC is parallel to AC, opposite prime, guys. So AC prime and A prime C. We'll say that, hey, those two guys are parallel. And we also are going to go ahead and say that BC prime and B prime C are also parallel. So those guys were parallel, and then those guys are supposed to be parallel. Then the claim is that we're going to get that A B prime and A prime B. So these two guys that aren't in yet have to be parallel. So throw them in. So the claim is that with the marked lines being parallel, you have to have the red lines also being parallel. So that would be case one. I'm not going to go over the proof of that one today. That one is actually your homework. So I'm going to let you guys worry about that one. Instead, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the case when these two lines are not parallel. So if they're not parallel, we know that by Proposition 6.1, that in an incidence geometry, and we know from our Proposition 14.1, any Cartesian plane over any field is an incidence geometry. If the lines are not parallel, they have to intersect in exactly one point. So let us bump ourselves over into what this would have to look like. And this time, I'm going to go ahead and adjust the symbol to the scripty N like it really should have been. So it's trying to be a scripty N. So this means that we're going to have some line. Let's call it scripty N right down here. And we know that that line N and the other line L are supposed to not be parallel, which means they must intersect. So this is case 2, where L and N are not parallel. And that was a terrible cross-hatching on parallel, but there you go. Okay. Now what do we know? Since... these two lines are not parallel, this tells us L and N must intersect. And I'll do the standard notation at point O. And this is proposition 6.1. Now, point O would be right here. Why is this standard notation O for origin? Okay. Now, apply our proposition 14.2, which says you can always do your linear change of variables. What we're going to do is we're going to call N our x-axis. We're going to call L our y-axis. Okay. We're also going to say that the origin in this situation is O, so we'll call it 0, 0. And then we have to pick unit points. Well, this is where we run into the issue of, whoops, we forgot to deal with those points A, B, and C, and then the prime versions A, B, and C. So if you notice up here, it says points A, B, and C without the prime version are on the line L, so they're going to be right here. And A, B, and C with the prime versions are going to be down here on line N. So let's go ahead and put them in. So suppose we look at, what's the first one? A, C prime. So maybe we have A right here. I'm just going to go ahead and label A right there. Maybe we have C prime right here. So this tells us, I'm going to go ahead and draw in this guy. And AC prime is supposed to be parallel to A prime C. So I'm going to go ahead and put A prime right here, just so I don't run off the end of my line N. And I'm going to go ahead and eyeball this one and try to make it look visibly parallel to AC prime. Okay. So this is just a rough sketch. And, speak, and because it's drawn on roughly a flat piece of paper with a pencil, this is in the model that looks like the standard model on R2. Okay. So we've got this guy. Those two guys are supposed to be parallel. So let me go ahead and put the little hatch marks in that indicate parallel. 
Now we're also supposed to be parallel BC prime and B prime C. Well, if we look at B prime C, C needs to come down somewhere here. So I'm going to go ahead and make it come down right about there. Did I have to put it right there? Nope, I totally could have put it over here, but my attempt to be a little bit less messy. And that's supposed to be parallel to BC prime. So attempting to make that line look parallel to B prime C, we'll go ahead and find point B up there. And notice the points A, B, and C got jumbled a little bit just because of where I drew that line C, B prime. Okay. So now we've got these lines, and I'll go ahead and mark here with hatch marks which lines are supposed to be parallel to each other. Now, the claim is that A, B prime is supposed to be parallel to A prime B, so let's go ahead and put the little hatch marks in here. If I'd actually drawn these guys with a straight edge, they would look so much better than they do right now, because right now they're only a very, very rough sketch. All right, but now that we have the rough sketch, while we don't have that A, B prime is parallel to A prime B, we do have enough information now to go ahead and start thinking about unit points. So our unit points, well, you get to pick them. And different people can pick different unit points. So we need to pick the which one of those points A, B, or C is 1, 0. Well, really, those guys would be the prime versions. And we need to pick which of the points A, B, or C is going to be called 0, 1. Okay. Well, I'm going to be super lazy. I'm just going to pick the first ones up from the origin. So on the y-axis, the L right here, we're going to choose point A to be our unit point. And on our x-axis, I'm going to go ahead and choose point B prime to be our unit point. And I'll actually go ahead and label them right over here. So this is 1, 0, and this guy right here is 0, 1. And I'll go ahead and label the picture as we walk through this. Now notice what we've just done. This is simply use our proposition 14.2, which says you can relabel things, you can do this linear change of variables to actually get some key information. The 1 and the 0 are the 1 and the 0 that is inside whatever field you actually have. So really, if we were very proper, like when we talked about fields before, this would be a 0 with a subscript F, a 1 with a subscript F. We're not going to worry about that today. Okay. So your origin and your two unit points. We're now going to go ahead and find the coordinates of all of these other points. So let's do it. Now, because of how these points are distributed out here, it turns out you can pick any collection of three points that are not the intersection point to call your A, B, and C unprimed or primed version. Okay? Which means there's not one fixed location for our C and B, our A prime, C prime. So what I'm going to do is a sneaky little trick. And a sneaky little trick right here is I'm going to take the next points out on the line the C and the C prime, and I'm going to call them an arbitrary something or other. So here, I'm going to go ahead and call C prime. I'm going to make this guy be A0. And up here at C, remember it's on the y-axis, so it would be 0. And I don't know how far along the y-axis it is, so I chose a second letter B. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and say let... C prime equal A0 and C equal 0B, where A and B are some elements of whatever field we're dealing with. In other words, whatever field is building our Cartesian plane behind the scenes. Now, let's give ourselves a little bit of an aside here. In other words, a game plan. So, aside slash game plan. So here's what we want. We want A, B to be parallel to A prime B. Okay. Now what does that mean? Since we're in a Cartesian plane, this is going to mean that these two lines have the same slope. Okay. Now, we've already put into effect the points A and B prime. They're the two unit points. 
So let's go ahead and look at that. The slope of a B prime is, well, let's just plug it in. It's change in Y over change in X. Well, the change in Y between A and B, you subtract the Y coordinates. So we'll have one minus zero. And change in X, you'll subtract the X coordinates. Make sure you line up the points correctly. And this will give you a negative one when you simplify it. So what does that mean? That means since we already know that the slope of this dotted line is negative one, we have to make sure that the slope of this second dotted line is also negative one. Well, right now there's no way to tell what it is because we don't know what points B and A prime are. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to find the coordinates of B and A prime, and then we'll co figure out what the slope is of this line. And if it's negative one, awesome, we're done. If it's not negative one, well, we just show that they're not parallel. And that Pappas' theorem doesn't work if your lines intersect. So, this means we need the slope of A prime B to be negative 1, 2. So, let's look at the lines we do now. Well, we know AC both versions are supposed to be parallel, and we know BC, both versions are supposed to be parallel, so we're going to look at both of them. And I'm going to bullet point this so sort of title it. If we look at AC prime, and we're given that it's parallel to A prime C, well, we can totally compute the slope of, well, one of them. So if we look at AC prime, here if we look at the slope, it's still that same change in y over change in x. So a c prime is this guy right here. Hey, we actually know what this point c prime is. It's one of the guys that we had to put an a in there. So we can say, hey, let's look at our change in y. It's 1 minus 0. And change in x, well, that's 0 minus a. And put this all together, and this is a negative 1 over a. Now we also have that the y-intercept of a c prime is here at 1 because a, the point, is the y-intercept. So this actually tells us the equation for our line is y equals negative uh, 1 over ax plus 1, the y-intercept. Okay. Now, when we look at the other guy, the a prime c, our slope, well, it's supposed to be, this line is supposed to be parallel to AC prime, so the slope is going to be identical. We already found it. We don't have to worry about finding it a second time. Okay? That's actually good because we don't have the point A prime over here. We couldn't find it another way. But this does let us know that our line is, well, the slope is negative 1 over AX. And if we want to find the plus B part, the plus the Y-intercept, well, A prime C, the Y-intercept is point C here, so this is plus B. Now, here's the awesome thing about configurations, is as you go through this, you'll find some line segments, or you'll find some equations of your lines, and then you'll be able to go and find some points. So, we can go ahead and find point A prime. Now, how can we do that? We know that A prime is on our x-axis, so that means it has a y-coordinate of 0. And if we plug that y-coordinate of 0 into the equation of the line for A prime C we just found, this gives us that 0 equals negative 1 over AX plus B. Now all you have to do is solve for X. And if we go ahead and solve for X here, we subtract B from both sides, multiply by negative A on both sides, you'll get A times B. Or plug it in and we'll check. Multiply A times B by the reciprocal of A, negative out front. That'll be negative B. Negative B plus regular B gives you 0. Okay. So this tells you, conclusion, A prime is totally AB 
zero. And there should be no little uh, comma down there, so let me get rid of that. So a, b, comma, zero. Okay. And if we put this up here in the pictures for reference for later, that would be a times b. Okay. And that's it. Now, notice we were able to pick up the coordinates for a prime, but we still don't have the coordinates up here for regular old b which means we're going to need to do this one more time, but this time we're going to need to do it with our B prime C and C prime B lines. Okay. And then we'll be able to pick up the coordinate for B. And why only one coordinate? Because B is on the Y axis, so the X coordinate of B right here is simply zero. Now, if we look at B C prime, we're told it's parallel to B prime C. And then we pick of these two lines, the line that has both of its endpoints. So we know C, we know B prime, so we're going to start with B prime C. So this tells us if we look at the slope of the line B prime C, the change in X here, we'll just subtract, not change in X, change in Y, we'll subtract the Y coordinates, so this would be B minus 0. Subtract the X coordinates would be 0 minus 1, make sure your points line up. So this would give us a slope of negative b, whatever b is. Okay. This then tells us that the equation of the line b prime c is going to be y equals negative bx. And then we just need to find the y-intercept, b prime c, y-intercept right here, c. So that would be plus b. Then we look at the other line segment. So this is b, b c prime. Its slope is the same as B prime C, so that negative B, because these guys are parallel to each other. So this then tells us, hey, all we need to worry about is the what the y-intercept is, except this one isn't easy like the other ones, because in all the other cases we had what the y-intercept is. Here we don't have the y-intercept, so I'm going to use a different equation for a line. Here our line equation I'm going to use is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. We have what the slope is. That's the negative b. So here we'll use a point we do have, and the point we do have is the c prime. So c prime has an x coordinate of a. It has a y coordinate of 0. So now we'll just solve for what that equation of the line is. And if we go ahead and solve for that equation of the line, notice it's super straightforward. We've got y equals negative bx plus ab. You actually, the only thing you needed to worry about was drop off that minus zero. Okay. So this takes care of finding the equations of the two line segments. So last thing we want to worry about here for that bullet point is we want to find the y coordinate of point b. Now point b is the y intercept of this line. So if we find the y intercept of this line, so find b y-intercept is when x equals 0, so we'll plug that in, and that tells you y equals a, b, or the point b is simply 0, a, b. And I'll go ahead and put that in the picture up here. So a, b. Now this is where we remember what we're looking for. We already found that the slope of a, b prime was negative 1. We need a prime b to be parallel to that guy, so that means we need the slope of a prime b to be negative 1. So let's go ahead and check it. So, slope of a prime b is change in y over change in x. Well, change in y is a b. Wow, that didn't work out. Let's try that again. A, B minus something. The X coordinates, 0 minus something. We go back up to what A prime was. A prime was also 0 in A, B, but it's flip-flop coordinates. So this means we have an Y coordinate of 0 and an X coordinate of A, B. And if you simplify that, that does turn out to be negative 1. Now, what's the conclusion here? Our conclusion is C 
since both the slopes of a b prime and a prime b are negative 1 then since we're in a Cartesian plane we are going to get that a b prime is parallel to a prime b since we're in some Cartesian plane and that's the definition of your lines being parallel or one way to determine your lines being parallel in a Cartesian plane. Okay. So that would be Pappas' theorem. Now, to be fair, that is exactly half of Pappas' theorem. The other half when you have your lines parallel, when I say parallel lines, I mean the L and the script the N lines parallel. If those two guys are parallel, the actual picture will look different. We saw it before we got into this bit, but the procedure is exactly the same. Please note your axes that you choose, your X and your Y axes, cannot be both that script DN and the script DL lines. Why? Because when they're parallel, they can't intersect. So you have to pick two lines that actually do intersect. Okay? So that would be the idea behind Pappas' theorem. And that's it. So that would be one way to root configurations with a proof. Please note, I did not try to put this proof into a T-chart. It wasn't because you couldn't. You actually could put this into a T-chart if you wanted to. I didn't just because I didn't want to bother with that for right now. I tried to write it out a little bit more in words, not highlight the stuff and make it easier to write out the algebra. Okay. Now, let us look at the second example. And the second example that I've got for us is a classic, classic thing that you do with configurations, which is for whatever reason you need to use this collection of lines and points that interact with each other in a specified way. And you want to check to see, hey, does that configuration actually exist in the Cartesian plane that I have? And if it does, awesome, then you can do whatever it is that you wanted to do. Okay. So here is the example. This is totally an example just pulled straight from your textbook. And it is also a very, very classic way of how it's worded. So this one says, find the necessary and sufficient condition for the configuration below to exist in a Cartesian plane. So right here for our Cartesian plane, standard symbols, capital pi with a subscript F over some field F with characteristic zero. Please note with that back, Ground. What we are assuming in this course is the smallest field that you're allowed to have is going to be Q or the set of rationals all the way up to, well, technically speaking, you could get into complex numbers, but we're really looking between rationals and reals. Okay. Now, what is this going to be asking us to do? This is really and truly behind the scenes asking, hey, could we do this in the Cartesian plane over Q? So like in a previous homework set that you guys looked at, you looked at Q squared or Cartesian plane over only rational, so your X and your Y coordinates could only be fractions, or do we have to have some extra number like a square root 2, like a square root 3 that gets thrown into this? So that's what it's actually asking us for. So let us go over the full procedure. First thing when you're dealing with the configuration is you want to make sure that all of your points are labeled. In the last example with Pappas' theorem, our points were, well, they were basically given to us, so we already had our labels. This time, we don't have labels. So let me go ahead and put on some labels, and let me make this easier for me to draw, and I'm going to scooch it a little bit closer to where my hand is going to be. Okay. So maybe you, and there's no real awesome way of doing this, Maybe you pick the point A, maybe you pick the point B. You know the corner points here have to be in there. Maybe this guy is point C, maybe this guy is point D. And then you're like, wait a second, there's lots more points. Why did I do that? Okay. So in reality, what are we looking for? We're looking for all the endpoints of line segments. So if we look around the outside, we see, hey, there's really a point E up here at the top. Well, there's also a point F here on the side, a G here also on the side an H here on the bottom. On the far side, we've got an, we'll go ahead and label an I. Not gonna lie, I don't normally use I's just because I don't like them. Remind me of indices. And then it turns out we also have some points on the inside. So here's the deal, if you have a configuration like this, you definitely for sure label all of the intersections that you have along the outermost edges, but you also look inside. And there's some of these points that for sure you're gonna need. 
any point that's the end point of a line segment you're going to need. So maybe we have here a K, maybe we have here an L, maybe we have here an M, maybe we have here an N. Okay. And it turns out there's two points I didn't mark, or two intersection points I didn't mark. And these intersection points are right here and right there where the hand is waving. Okay. Those two points are perfectly fine to be labeled in this configuration. However, in the grand scheme of things, you're actually not going to need them. Okay. Sometimes your intersection points of two lines where there's no endpoints involved are needed. And in one of your homework questions, you've got one where you're going to have to worry about that guy. Okay. But most of the time, you're not going to need to worry about him. Okay. So step one, label all the important parts. So one, label points. Okay. Now, second step is we want to pick our x-axis, our y-axis. So whoops. So pick x-axis y-axis, our origin, and our unit points. Okay. So here, what I would recommend is always picking your x-axis to be the lowest or the bottom most um, line in the configuration. I would always, always, always recommend your x and your y-axis to be some of the longer lines in your configuration. And I personally would recommend making them the lowest line and the leftmost line, just because most people work better in the first quadrant. Okay, So for us, our x-axis, I'm going to go ahead and pick that guy as the line segment DC or the line DC. Y-axis, so that's this guy right down here. Y-axis, I'm going to go ahead and pick that guy as the leftmost, so that would be A to D. And once you have your x and your y axes, your origin is 100% defined. It is their intersection point. So notice here, D, intersection point of those two lines. Then you get some choices. Your unit points can be any points you want on your x or your y axis. Personal preference. Um, t often, people will pick the first point out from the origin on your two axes to be your unit points, but you don't have to. Like here, you could totally pick A and C to be your unit points. These guys would definitely get into some fractional things more than otherwise, so I'm just going to pick the first points out, so H and I is going to be the unit points that I pick. But again, as long as those unit points are not the origin, you're good to go. Okay. Now let's go ahead and label in terms of coordinates what we have so far. We know D is the origin. We know H is a unit point. We know C is on the x-axis. We know I is a unit point. And we know J and A are on the y-axis. Okay, And that's all we know so far. Now, that's a little bit of a Y. So if we look at the axes, and unit points, and oh, let's say, and some other key points. So what did we just find? We just found the x coordinate of A and J. We just found the y coordinate of C. And I'm going to claim we actually can find one more point. We actually can find the point N. We can, but let me wait on that one right now. Instead, I'm going to focus on the point C. Okay. We'll do N all together on a slightly another way. Okay. So here with point C, right there, we know that the Y coordinate is 0, but the X coordinate, well, we don't really know it. Here, we said that D to H is 1 unit, so H has the coordinates 1, 0. C visibly doesn't look like 2, 0. It just looks like well, something bigger than 1 for x, x co coordinate. So this is how you determine, hey, you know what? That guy, that guy is going to be where I put in my unknown letter, okay? 
my variable that I'm going to have to solve for, my guide that I hope that coordinate A is actually in my field, but I still have to actually figure it out. Okay. Now, if we if it turns out we need a second point that has a letter in it, that second point that has a letter can only be point A or J. You can't have anybody else with letters here. All of these guys have to be written in terms of A. And if we had a second one, we'd put a B here at either A, point A or point J. Now, you want as few of these unknowns as humanly possible. So we're going to strive as hard as possible to not put in a uh, letter B there. We're going to try to just make it some expression in terms of only A's. Now, fourth thing we're going to do is where we're going to play with our lines. Pretend that says lines. Okay. Now, we know a couple of things. One of the things we know is our vertical and our horizontal lines. So if we look at our vertical lines, so this would be A to D, the y-axis. Well, we also have somebody else. What's well, the other side? So that's B to C. And just as a heads up, this little guy right here, I just noticed it, is trying to be a G. Okay. But we're also parallel to two inside lines, E, L, and N, K. N, H, excuse me. Okay. Now, what do we know about vertical lines? Vertical lines are always given by X equals equations. So if we look at A, D... This guy is your y-axis. So in terms of its equation, it would be x equals 0. And in fact, we already use that. Now, if we looked at b, c, what we know here is that it's the equation x equals a. So we actually know something about those three points b, f, and g. They all have an x-coordinate of a. So here's a. F also has an x-coordinate of A, and B also has an x-coordinate of A. Okay, And if you want to write that down here, you totally can, or I'm just going to fill it in for the vertical lines. Now, we also looked at the line EL. EL, yeah, I don't really have any information about this one, so it's going to be x equals something. We'll have to come back and deal with that one later. And then the last one is NH. Now, NH, H is a unit point, so this one means it's X equals 1, and we are totally able to put in X equals 1 on our point N. Okay. So that's vertical lines. Now, we could do the exact same thing with our horizontal lines. And our horizontal lines here, if we do bottom to top, we've got DC, we've got IM, we've got KF, and we've got AB. Okay. Now some of these we know. For sure we know DC. Well, DC is the x-axis, so that's the same as y equals 0, and we already dealt with that one. I am, I is a unit point, so that means we take the y value of the unit point, and that's going to be y equals 1, okay. which tells us that, hey, everybody on I to M has a y value of 1, and bam, notice what we just got. We just got the point N. Okay. A lot of people don't bother to write down the vertical lines and just write all of this information up along all of the points as they go along. Okay. Now we also have KF. KF, we don't have enough information to deal with yet. So KF, I'm going to go ahead and write it over here. This is Y equals, I don't know, we'll come back to it. We also have AB, 
that line on the very, very top. And again, this one also, we don't have enough information to come back to deal with that line yet. We'll have to come back to it. But we do have a lot of information now about all of these positive slope lines. So let's deal with all of them next. There's four of them. Notice as soon as we got this point N, we're going to have a lot of information. So I'm going to label these guys as positive slope lines. And that's going to include DN or really DNF. So I'll just write it as DF. This guy looks parallel to HMG, so just HG, which looks parallel to ILB or just IB, which looks parallel to the last one, JKE or just JE. Oh, let's get off that colon. We already have a colon in that line. Okay. Now, here's the great part. DF, we know something. So for DF, we can find its slope, change in Y over change in X, using the points N and D. Notice you have the origin and you have the point 1, 1. This totally gives you a slope of 1, and through the origin means this line is the line Y equals X. Now, you don't have to do what I'm about to do, but something that I like to do, especially if I'm doing scratch work and fast here, is I like to go ahead and say, hey, whoops, that did not expect to happen. This is the same as the line y equals x. Now, notice with the line y equals x, we have both a unit point here at h and a unit point here at i, we are going to have the same slope here, the slope of 1 for both of these two guys. We've got a point where we know both coordinates for both of them right over here, which means we're totally going to be able to figure out everything along this line and the two lines next to it and parallel to it. So while we're on this line right here, let's go ahead and get all the coordinates for all the points on the line. We already have 0, 0, 1, 1. F here, since y equals x, is going to have to be the point A, A. Wow, did not want to dot. Just a second. So, AA. So, note, this is where we picked up the point F. And you can totally write that out as well. I'm going to look at the line IB next. You don't have to. You totally could have done HG next. I'm going to do IB next just because it's the easy one to do. The slope here equals 1, and it has a y-intercept at I or at 1. So this tells you your equation of your line is x plus 1. And I'll go ahead and write that up here. Okay. Now, once you have your equation of y equals 1 y does not equal 1, y equals x plus 1, notice you can go in and fill in all of these other guys. L we'll actually be able to get, but let's come back to him. B for sure we're going to be able to get, because if we know x is a, then y has to be a plus 1. So a, wow, that's a terrible a. Let's try again. So we have a plus 1. Okay. Now we're actually going to have to backfill something to be able to get point L. Notice, previously we said we couldn't get the line KF because we didn't know what the y-coordinate was. Well, now we know the y-coordinate. It's A from point F. So we can go back to this horizontal line KF and say, hey, this is y equals A. And now we'll plug in. So... Here, L equals something, comma, A. K equals something, comma, A. Okay. Now, I can't do anything more with that right now, but that does tell us, well, we were working on this line A, L, B, where Y equals X plus 1. Well, if y equals 1 more than x, now that we know y equals a, that does tell you that x here has to be a minus 1. Okay. 
and that gives you now the coordinates of L. Now, before we move on to our next line, which will be H, G right here, notice by getting this X coordinate of L, we're able to go back to some of these vertical and horizontal lines we didn't know. These ones, you're always going to have some of them you don't know, and as you get the extra coordinates, the extra points here, you're going to start filling them in. We're actually going to be able to fill in the two missing ones. We're going to be able to fill in EL right here, because EL was X equals something. Well, we have point L now, so that means we know that X equals A minus 1. So let's go ahead and fill in the coordinate for point E. So point E has the same X coordinate as point L, so A minus 1. Now, we can do the exact same thing for that line AB. Notice, we don't have a Y coordinate for either A or E, but previously we found the Y, which is a second ago, we found the um, both coordinates for point B, the A, and then A plus 1. So that means that our horizontal line right up there, and let me make this so we can see this, our horizontal line at AB is totally going to be Y equals... A plus 1. Now if y equals a plus 1, that means the y coordinates of both of those two points have to be a plus 1. So let's go ahead and put fill that in of a plus 1. I did not leave myself enough room to do that. So a plus, pretend that's a 1. Here we have a plus 1. So, in terms of coordinates, we still have some that we don't know. We don't know yet this the coordinates of point G. We don't know yet the coordinates of M or K or J. But notice what we do know. We know the slope of all four of these lines. We've got one complete point down here at H, so we can easily find the equation of this line and those two points. We don't know either the points J or K, but now we know the point E. So with one point E and the slope here being one because it's parallel to the other three lines we're going to be able to find the equation of those two lines and that'll give us the coordinates of all of the points in terms of a the equations of all the lines except for the line ac which we'll deal with at the end okay so that completes out looking at the line a to b let's go ahead and grab the next easiest one which is h to g and we'll do j to e last i'm going to scroll down so we can see this one and this is going to be h to G. So we know here the slope is 1. We know we have the unit point H. So I'm going to use that same formula we had before, which is Y minus 0, because that's the Y value of point H, times the slope, which is 1, times X minus 1. That's the X coordinate of the point. So when we put this all together, that'll give us the equation Y equals X minus 1. Now, y equals x minus 1. That means the y coordinate is 1 less than the x coordinate. So, when we go up and find m and g, notice g is the most straightforward. We have the x coordinate is a, so plug a in for x, and y is a minus 1. Wow, that didn't work out so well. Let us try that again. So this is a minus 1. We also know, we said what? We said this line was y equals x minus 1. So m here would need to be what? If y is 1 less than the x, this would need to be a 2 comma 1. Double check, plug in 2 for x, do you get back 1? Hopefully you are all thinking, yep. Okay. So that takes care of this line and the two points on that line. Last line we have to deal with that is parallel to the other three is going to be J, K, and E. So we're going to find this guy. E is the coordinates A minus 1, A plus 1. So that was J all the way to E. We know the slope is 1, and we know that E was A minus 1, A plus 1. So, we're going to have y minus a plus 1 
equals the slope of 1 times x minus a minus 1. So put that all together and we'll have y equals x. No surprise there. I'm going to distribute out so we have negative a plus 1. And when we move this to the other side, we're going to have plus a plus 1. So that gives us a slope, or excuse me, a line of x plus 2. So let's do it. I'm going to write down y equals x plus 2 in the picture. y equals x plus 2. Now, run that through the coordinates, or the two points that have missing coordinates. Easiest one is j. x equals 0. This means that y has to equal 2. And for k here, if y equals x plus 2 and y equals a, solve for x. In other words, subtract 2 from this guy, and we will have a minus 2. And that gives us all the coordinates for all of the points in terms of a. And that should also give us everything in terms of the equation of all of the lines. Double check. All the question marks are crossed off. Yep, 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 yep. Doing good there. So the last thing that we need to worry about here is going ahead and dealing with this line a to c. I on purpose looked at this line A to C last for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is because it's unique. It's the only one that is a negative slope right here. Another reason I picked it was because it is dealing with four points. So it's got, eh, if you ignore these points here, it's got the most num. Well, actually, if you don't ignore those parts, points still, it's got the most number of points on the line of anybody in terms of intersections. So we're going to actually use this guy as a special thing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to transcribe all of this information on the next little picture. So I'm going to pause this for a second so you don't have to see me do that. And then we'll jump in and see how AC works. All right. So what we are looking at here is what we've done so far with the configuration. At this stage, often people think, hey, I'm done, or they're not sure where to go next. Okay? So this is what you do once you've got all of your points written in terms of your unknown letter that you pick. I picked A for this example, that lowercase a that's propagated throughout these equations and these points. Do all equations and all coordinates of all the points have a letter A? No, and that's totally okay. Now. I'm going to pick on this line AC right here. So for this negative slope line, we know a couple of things. Okay, Turns out that we can actually find the slope of this line more than one way. Okay, You've got one, two, three, four points that we have. Turns out you can pick any pair of those points and find a formula for the equation of the slope of your line. Okay, So for example, maybe we pick on the points A and C because they're the two endpoints, that may be what you're naturally thinking, okay? So, using points A and C, and just to remind ourselves here, point A's coordinates was 0, A plus 1, and C's coordinates were A, comma, 0. Then the slope of the line segment is determined by your change in y's. So maybe you have a plus 1 from point a minus the y value in point c all over the change in x. So 0 minus a. So this guy here is exactly the same thing as a plus 1 on the top, negative a on the bottom, or you can pull that negative out front. Okay. So that would be the slope. Now, what happens if you pick different points? So I'm going to pick on point C again because it's relatively simple in its coordinates. But the simplest one is the point M here that actually has both of its coordinates to be integers. So suppose we used C and M. So using point C and M. So here C was still the A0 for its coordinates and M is 2, 1. Formula for the slope of a line is still the same. We're going to do change in y over change in x. So we'll have here change in y is 0 minus 1. Change in x is a minus 2. Please, please, please make sure you match 
your points stacked on top of each other. So we pull this over and simplify it. This is the same as negative one over a minus two. And notice what just happened. We have the slope of the same line calculated more than one way. This tells you what? It tells you those two expressions have to be equal to each other. Now, it tells you a couple of other things. This tells us that, hey, the equation of our line AC is either going to be y equals negative a plus 1 over a times x plus the y-intercept, and we actually have the y-intercept. Our y-intercept is point a right up there, and we saw that point a's y-coordinate was a plus 1. But you could also have written it as y equals negative 1 over a minus 2 x plus, again, the y-intercept of a plus 1. Okay. So, hence, we must have that our two slopes, two expressions for the slopes are really equal. So negative a plus 1 over a must equal negative 1 over a minus 2. Now, if we multiply these guys together, we simplify or cross-multiply, notice one thing. One thing is both of them are negative, so these two negatives are totally going to cancel out once we start multiplying. We can go ahead and cross-multiply, and I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and cancel the negative on both sides, then multiply the a times 1 and the a plus 1 times a minus 2. Now this is totally going to turn us into an equation that we can go ahead and solve. Okay, So for this equation, if we multiply out, we're going to have a squared, and the middle terms here would be, what is that, negative a plus, oops, minus 2 equals a. And move it all together, we're going to have a squared minus 2a minus 2 equals 0. Then at this point, we just have to remember the quadratic equation. So for us, and for anybody solving a quadratic equation, we're going to have here that a equals, and here's where picking a is going to have a nice, wonderful confusion. Okay. So the classic formula for your quadratic equations talks about a's and b's and c's when you have an equation that's normally in terms of x's. I'm going to use talk us through that same quadratic equation using the a, b's, and c's like you would have seen back in high school. However, technically speaking, you don't want to have a's doing two different things. We're totally going to ignore that for right now. Okay. So using the quadratic equation, the quadratic qu equation says it's negative b, so negative the coefficient on a, so there's negative your negative 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so that's our negative 2 squared, minus 4ac, the a here being the coefficient on the a squared, and the c being the other negative 2. Whole thing divided by 2a, the a here being the coefficient on the a squared. Okay. Now, we'll go ahead and simplify that up, and we'll have 2 plus or minus mess under the square root. Under everything, we're going to have an over 2. The stuff inside of that square root, well, the negative 2 squared is simply going to be 4. 4 and 2 multiplied together will give you 8. It'll turn positive. So that's going to be a square root of 12 on the inside. Now here's the deal. We're going to have to simplify that square root. 12 is the same as 4 times 3. So scratch work to the side. That 4 comes out as a square root 4, square root 3, which means this guy, to remind yourselves, is simply 2 root 3. So we have 2 plus or minus 2 root 3 on the top all over 2. So when we simplify, this is 1 plus or minus the square root of 3. Now, it turns out there's only one answer, but we can figure out which of these two answers it's going to be. We're either going to add square root 3 to 1 or subtract square root 3 to 1. Turns out, regardless of which one it is, it's not going to change your answer, so if you don't want to check this, you don't have to in the future. But here's how you would get the actual answer. And this is actually how we get the computer-generated pictures is we have to solve this. 
All right, so we're going to add or subtract square root 3 to 1. If we go back to our picture, notice where a lives. So if a is plus or minus, is 1 plus or minus square root 3, but it's to the right of our unit point, notice what we're going to need to do here. We're actually going to have to add square root of 3 to make it bigger, because if you subtracted square root 3, this point c would actually be on the wrong side of h. It would be actually over here on the negative side of the, ax the x-axis. Okay. So, in conclusion, this tells us, so, so, a equals 1 plus the square root of 3. Now, we're not going to do it, but at this point, you can then go back and use a equals 1 plus the square root of 3 to figure out all of these other coordinates. So g here would be 1 plus square root 3. a minus 1 would just be square root 3. This would be 1 plus square root 3 in both of them. This would be 1 plus square root 3, 2 plus square root 3, and so forth for all of these other guys. It would also, and this is where you guys can check it on your own, it will also give you the slope here is going to be exactly the same for these two um, different expressions. All right. Now, so what? What do we do with this? How do we actually answer the question? Because remember what the question was. The question way back when, before we were doing all of the algebra, says find the necessary and sufficient condition for that configuration to exist in your Cartesian plane with characteristic zero. Well, smallest field with characteristic zero is Q, or the set of all rationals. Now, what do we have for sure? All of these unit points, the origin, point J here, uh, point n, point m, all of those are integer coordinates. They for sure will actually live in any field where 2 is unit point plus unit point, if you will, or 1 plus 1. Okay, So all of these guys that look like integers, totally going to be in whatever field. If you have something that looks like a proper fraction, totally going to be in your field. In other words, think of it as being in your set of rationals or in your field of rationals. Now, everybody else, line here, all of those y-intercepts, all those slopes are totally integers, so they're inside our field of rationals. That's no worries there. And these other lines, or these other points that we can see, are all in terms of a, so we could figure them out in terms of a. And the slope and expression, the equation for ac, is also in terms of a here. So all the points that have a in it and the equation for line ac are in terms of a. What does that mean? These guys here where you're adding and subtracting, adding and subtracting is something you can do in any field as long as the elements originally came from the field. This dividing here, this subtracting, you can do that in any field as long as the elements came from the field originally. So the only thing that we have to have is we have to have this point A actually in our field. So let's write this up. So all of the points and lines can be written in terms of A. Okay. So if all the points and lines are in our Cartesian plane over our field, then the points and lines are the coordinates, coordinates of the points A through N and the lines, I'm not going to write down all the lines. And for the lines you're looking for slope and y-intercept must be in your field. Okay, So that's the logical back and forth. Now note, 1 and 0 are always inside of your field. Okay, So that also means that things like then 2, 3, etc. 
are also in your field. So automatically we get those points that look like integers in your field. So sent, and that's because that your field is closed under addition, subtraction, has negatives. It also means you're going to have your fractions because you have multiplicative inverses. Okay, So it comes down to this. To get those extra guys that are in terms of A, we must have point C in the Cartesian plane. But what does that really mean? This means we must have that little A in the field. Now remember what A was. It's literally right above us, right before we started this paragraph. A is 1 plus the square root of 3. Well, 1 is no worries, and adding two things in the field are no worries. So what does this really mean? The only way to have your point A in the field is if you have your square root of 3 in your field. Once you have the square root of 3 in your field, you'll get point A automatically. You, put, you get uh, element A automatically, which means you get point C automatically. Since everything's written in terms of little a's, the equation for line AC and all of those other points, that means automatically you'll get all those points in that last line to be in your Cartesian plane. So, this tells us conclusion in order for this Cartesian plane. I lie. This configuration to exist. In some Cartesian plane, square root 3 must be in the underlying field that defines or creates that Cartesian plane. Now, let's tie that into what we said about smallest fields. Okay? Smallest field with characteristic 0 is a field of all rationals. Now, if you want the smallest field that contains this configuration, so note, smallest field containing, containing square root 3 with characteristic 0 is, well, it's Q adjoin whatever it is that you need. In this case, Q adjoins square root 3. And to remind this, this is the situation. I should not use an A because we've used A too many times. This is take any number you want. Oh, I don't want to use X's and Y's because they're for X, Y coordinates. How about, oh, how about P? P plus R square root 3, where P and R are rationals. Now, since every um, fraction that has a square root of 3 in the denominator can be rationalized to move it up to the top of the fraction, that will work even if you actually need to divide by A or have, well, what we have A minus 2 up there in one of our expressions, okay? So this here would be your smallest field, okay? But note, you couldn't have this field just to be the set of all rational numbers. Why? Because square root 3 is an irrational number. So you would get right up here, this point C is not in Q2. Okay. So that's a crash course on configurations. Um, this here would be your summary. And how to get to that summary is you are looking for one line where you can write its slope in at least two different ways. You set that slope equal to each other and solve out for your unknown. Okay. Take it from me. Definitely, definitely, definitely when you're plugging in for unknowns, make sure your unknown is on one of your axes and make sure there is at all possible 
only one unknown. If you try to get to two unknowns, you'll make this stuff more complicated.